Hi, and welcome to the special broadcast with uh, retired Chief Inspector Gary Raymond. I met Gary Raymond a few years ago and I found him to be such a godly Christian man. And today he wants to share with you his experience as a police officer and how his Christianity was used to make an, an impact in the lives of many people. Enjoy the sermon. Greetings, everybody. I'm Detective Chief Inspector Gary Raymond, retired, and uh, I was firstly an ambulance officer, did five years with New South Wales Ambulance, and then joined the police force where I did 34 years service. I was in the police force general duties, that is general patrol and answering triple zero calls. Then I went to uh, police rescue bomb disposal squad. From there, I trained as a detective then I went on to duty officer, which is crime scene and emergency management. I was a terrorism risk assessor and finally um, ended up as a duty officer where I retired. Uh, part of my work in police rescue squad was not only doing road crash extrications and cliff rescues, but I was also a suicide crisis negotiator, which is talking people down from jumping off buildings, cliffs, bridges, the gap, wherever. And so I've had an amazing experience. And uh, I guess too, the most amazing experience that I've ever had was surrendering to Jesus Christ to make him my saviour and Lord. And I guess too, as a police officer, people are always resisting arrest. And so we often say to them, stop resisting, stop resisting. And uh, I guess, too, the sooner they stop resisting, the sooner the better. No one gets hurt. Well, God did it with me. He said, Gary, stop resisting. I love you. I died for you in Christ on the cross to forgive you everything you've ever done and going to do. My blood was just absolutely covered your sin. Gary, surrender. And on the 29th of November, 1979, I surrendered to Jesus and I gave in. And so my first point today is maybe you've been resisting God's loving arrest. He's forgiving. Maybe you've been resisting handing your life over to him. Maybe you've been resisting thanking him for dying on the cross in Christ for you. Well, Today might be the day that you stop resisting arrest and you give in to the enormous love of Jesus over your life. I've been asked to speak on some miracles that I've experienced whilst being a police officer. And as a Christian police officer, every day was a miracle. The opportunity to meet with people who were victims of crime, witnesses of crime, and yes, offenders. And I was able to talk to them about Jesus and talk to them about what he means to me and what he could mean to them. I guess we're going to start, and I always do, with Scripture. That is the Bible, and you might call it the Bible. Uh, we call it the police training manual. Not really, but it is fancy uh, a police officer talking about the Bible as a training manual. It does. It just trains us in not only our lives but in our policing as well. And many a times I've had to read my Bible after a critical incident where I need God's assurance that he's with me, comforting me and bringing me through that. And so two things come up this morning. Firstly, we need to know that God reveals himself to us. God doesn't play hide and seek. Matter of fact, he says in his word, and I'll read it now. It's John chapter 14, uh, verses 20 and 21. That's John chapter 14, verses 20 and 21. And I'll tell you what, these beautiful words, you listen to this. This is a God that says, I'm going to make myself known. It says, at that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, 
It is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, isn't that amazing? Those words particularly, I will manifest myself to him. So God's going to totally and utterly reveal himself in his word to us. And so in our Bible, we can read everything about God, his character, what he's done in Christ and what he's doing by his Holy Spirit. Everything is revealed in his word. But, wow, Gary, what's this but mean? Now, I've found as a police officer that I don't always understand what God does or allows to happen. It's beyond my understanding at times. Now, sometimes I can see the foolish things that people do, the, the speeding in a car, driving whilst drunk or drugged or not paying attention, using your phone or other devices. And, I mean, that's ex that can be explained where they're doing a foolish thing. But you know what the interesting thing is? God says that we've got a conscience. And so he reveals himself totally and utterly through our conscience. For example, you're driving on the street and you're exceeding the speed limit. Now, two things might happen. You might be frightened that the highway patrol is going to pull up and give you a ticket. Or secondly, you mightn't care less. You want to get somewhere or you want to see someone and you, know, you have total disregard for everybody else. Do you know what happens? As you're speeding, God the Holy Spirit says to every person, stop it, slow down. Number one, you're going to kill someone or yourself. Or secondly, you're going to get booked. You're going to get punished for this. Slow down. And what happens? People disobey the Holy Spirit's promptings. They have a crash and kill themselves or people. And guess what happens? God gets the blame. Oh, God, where were you in that crash? Why couldn't you come down and stop it? You know, God, how supernatural are you? And all the time, he's absolutely done his will and purpose in speaking to our conscience. And he does that with criminals too. Every single criminal knows before they commit their crime, they feel this urge in them not to do it. And that's the Holy Spirit talking to their conscience. And what happens? They go ahead and disobey God, the Holy Spirit, commit their crime, and guess who gets the blame? God or the devil made me do it. So acting on that conscience, I can see as a police officer day in and day out where people have disregarded God's prompting and committed a crime and getting punished. Now, God said he will reveal himself to us. We just saw that. He says, I will manifest myself to him. But guess what? If we have a look at Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, that's Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, there's something else comes up about this. And if we have a look at it, it's amazing. It says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Isn't that interesting? God's ways are higher than our ways and we can never, never fathom his thoughts. So there's two things there. God reveals himself to us, his character, his personality, his attributes, but we'll never understand sometimes the way he works. His ways often are totally different than what we ever thought. Let me give you a couple of examples when I was a police officer. When I was a detective, I was at Blacktown Police Station and I was upstairs doing some book work and getting a brief of evidence ready. And suddenly on the public address system, Detective Raymond, Detective Raymond urgently down in the foyer, urgently down in the foyer, Detective Raymond, urgent, urgent, urgent. 
Now, in police language, when something's said three times, you stop and listen. It's a bit of a code that means this is really bad. And being a former ambulance officer, whenever things went wrong around the station environment or outside on the street, they used to always call me because I could assist with pre-hospital care prior to the ambulance arriving. So I hurriedly went downstairs and I came to the, uh, the entrance to the reception area and there was a young police officer there and he's staring at me and I said, what's wrong? And he, and he pointed over the counter point, and he, he was pale. And so I actually jumped over the counter and on the floor was a lady around mid-30s and she had a butcher's knife sticking out of her tummy. It was fairly well embedded. And there was a, a couple of people kneeling around her. And what had happened was she was walking just down the road from the police station, would you believe, and her estranged husband got a knife and he went up to her, confronted her and stabbed her in the street in broad daylight. And so we later arrested him at Blacktown Railway Station, still in possession of the knife. And so there she was and she's staring at me she was pale, her pulse was rapid, and really, really her blood pressure had dropped. She was bleeding internally. Now, you may or may not know those here who are medically trained know that you don't ever um, pull out an object that's impaled because what happens, a few things happen. Number one is it might tear tissue on the way out as well as it did on the way in. Secondly, the clotting mechanism that helps blood to clot, you get, uh, well, you see it when you get a scab. I mean, a scab is just a dried out blood clot. And uh, you see if you cut yourself and you pinch it or put some direct pressure on it, it stops bleeding after a while because the clotting factor causes uh, the bleeding to either reduce or slow down. If you pull a knife out, you disturb that web that's got all the little cells in it, which is a clot. And so when you do that, bleeding starts again. So what I did is what you do, I left it intact and I patted a big block of trauma dressings around the knife wound and the entrance to where the knife was. Then I got some tape and put it over the handle of the knife, sort of like tent pegs or tent stays to keep the knife nice and steady from moving. And I told her to be still, but I could see her, she looked very pale and she was starting to hyperventilate, which was an indication of shock. She was getting very clammy. Um, sweat is where it runs. That clamminess is where those little beads stick and that's a, a real indication of a shock happening to the body. And, and as, as I was kneeling there, I'd done all my medical that I could. We put her legs up and raised her, her legs somewhat so we can get a little bit more circulation into the major organs. And the ambulance had been called and we're waiting for the ambulance. Well, I don't know if you've ever had a, an incident where you're waiting for the ambulance, like minutes seem like 20 minutes, you know, or 20 minutes seems like an hour. Because I'd done all my first aid as a Christian, I knew what I had to do next and I was moved by the Holy Spirit and compassion to pray for this lady. So I just gently touched on the shoulder and I prayed uh, something like, Lord Jesus, please let this lady know that you're present. Let her know that you forgave her sin on Calvary, on the cross, that you died for her. Let her know too, Lord, that you can, if you desire, to heal her, to get her through this. And, and, Lord, so that she knows you and gets to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. With that, we heard the siren. Paramedics came running in and they put an IV in her and started some really heavy gushing fluids into her veins to try and get that blood volume, that circulatory volume up a bit. Uh, and so they rushed her down to hospital. She went into emergency for a short time. And then straight in the operating theatres where a group of amazing surgeons uh, opened her up, removed the knife, opened her up and repaired the damage. Well, a few days later, she'd got out of intensive care 
and I went down there to get a statement from her uh, for the brief of evidence because, as I mentioned, we'd arrested her husband already and he was in custody. And uh, I'll never forget it. I was sitting, you know, when you visit someone in hospital, you sit on a chair beside the bed and you start talking and I got my police notebook out and showed her my, my ID and uh, I said, look, um, I need to get a statement off you about what happened. And so what happened out there? She started staring at me like that funny look like this. What? And she looked around to see that no one was around and she said, I know who you are. No one else does, but I do. I said, well, who am I? She said, you're an angel. I thought, wow, my wife and mother-in-law think I'm an angel, but no one else. And I said, what do you mean? I'm not an angel. I'm a detective sergeant in the police. She said, don't lie to me. Why? Do, you're an angel. I know. Why, why not be truthful? I said, I'm being truthful. She said, you are an angel. I know your voice. I remember your voice. I said, yeah. She said, you, the angel, when I was dying on the floor of wherever I was, she said, I heard you tell me about Jesus. And she said, while I was dying on my back on the floor, she said, I cried out to God in my heart to save me and to forgive me and to see me through this. She said, I know who you are and I know what you said to me. And I said, look, I got my badge out again. I said, look, I'm a, I'm a police officer. I'm a detective sergeant. I'm not an angel, whatever you say. She said, I'm not worried about that badge. Angels can get everything or anything. She said, I even thought I manifested a, a badge. And I said, look, I hate to disappoint you. I know you're expecting an angel but you got a cop instead. And I said, I was the one who was treating you, giving you first aid, pre-hospital care, and when I'd done that, I started to pray with you and I prayed into your heart and your life in Jesus' name. And she started to cry and she said, thank you. Thank you so much. She said, I remember. I remember well. And I said, well, you said you'd spoke to Jesus during that time, do you want me to explain what we call the gospel message or the good news? She said, yes, please. And I explained the full gospel message to her. And I said, do you want to thank Jesus right now for two things, dying on the cross for you and saving your life from this incredibly terrible wound? And she said, yes, and we prayed together. And after we finished praying, I got the statement from her and uh, went back and prepared the, brief, the brief of evidence. I was there one day a few weeks later and they said, there's someone downstairs to see you. So I came from the office downstairs and there's this lady there. And she said, do you mind if we have a talk? I said, sure. So we went into an interview room and she said, I started going to church. She said, I've committed my entire life to Jesus. And she said, I'm going to use what happened to me as my own personal story. And I want your permission to mention, and she started laughing. She said that I was spoken to by an angel with a police badge. <laughs> and I said, of course, yeah, look, you know, give God the glory for that. And, uh, and so she did that, started going to church, grew in Christ, her husband divorced her after he, he went into prison. He did. Uh, he was sentenced to nine years for attempted murder. And her life got to back, back together nicely. And a few years down the track, she met a beautiful man at church and was married to him, and they're both serving the Lord strongly. You know, I often think that we've done things in our lives to muck it up, haven't we? Me, you, everyone here... I reckon we've done things to mess our life up. But guess what? God fixes it up. He's a specialist. And by the way, the word says, the Bible says that he will make us a new creation 
the old things go and the new things come. Brand new. In other words, look, he's not going to patch us up. He's not going to do a renovation of our lives. He's actually, with love and grace and mercy, demolish our lives. He wants to demolish us with love and gentleness, then to make us brand new. And so today, maybe you should say, God, please, please demolish me. I want to be brand new in Jesus. I want to be brand new in my life. And so allow him to do it, as I said, with his love. Well, another incident. I think you can see there where uh, as Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, and in that verse 9 it says, my way is higher than your ways. I can see that the way God worked in that lady's life on that floor was higher than I ever thought is a way that God would work. Another incident was uh, a, a fellow who was a merchant banker and he was on a million dollars a year. Now, that's not bad though, is it? He had this high-flying executive job and uh, during his work time, he, for some reason, he met a prostitute. Now, he was married to a lovely lady with two children, a little boy and a little girl. Now, he started frequenting this brothel and got to know this prostitute and finally, inverted commas, inverted commas, fell in love with her. But I tend to say it's probably fell in lust with her. But anyway, so he got her out of the brothel and he, he put her up in a beautiful apartment overlooking Sydney Harbour, gave her everything she wanted, and he thought, wow, this is fabulous. What a life this is. You know, self-gratification at its best. He opened his bank account to her. He took her on overseas trips and he did this whole self-gratification self thing, as I mentioned. Well, one day he came home from work and she was gone. Surprise. Not only did she go, but she took and cleaned out his entire bank account, which was quite a, a substantial amount. And she took off back overseas with his money and left all everything behind. Well, he went into the depths of depression and he was alone for quite a few weeks and he decided... I should go back home. So I mean, he went back home, knocked on the door. Oh, darling, darling, I know what I've done. Can I come back to you? Can I come back to you? And she said, how dare you? You've hurt me. You've hurt our children. And you come here wanting to come back? Get out of my sight. I never want to see you ever again. How dare you? And so he went into the depths of depression. He left the house there. He got into a taxi and he went to the Gap at Watson's Bay. Now, for those who are not Sydney-siders, um, the Gap is a, the southern peninsula part of it, of Watson's Bay or the Sydney Harbour. He got out of the taxi and he ran up through the stairway, ran south down the footpath and jumped the fence over the cliff to take his own life. So we were at the police rescue squad and the alarms went off, the emergency triple zero from our communication centre, and they said, we've got a body recovery at the Gap, just south of the Gap. And so we got in our rescue trucks, the crew, and we headed towards that area. No lights or sirens. So two things in the rescue squad. Number one is a rescue. That's where people are alive. And number two, we did recoveries body recoveries, and that's where people sadly and regrettably have lost their lives. So we arrived at the Gap and we're setting up our cliff rescue apparatus. We looked down and saw his body on the rocks. And as we're setting up the apparatus, a young police officer came up to me and he said, excuse me, Mr. Aymer. I said, yes, mate. And he said, I think I saw his arms move. I said, oh, right, thanks very much. I thought he was seeing things because what happens is that often when you look over a cliff or down a height, you get this mesmerising effect, particularly on hot days off the rocks where the heat's coming up and things look like they're moving, they're not. So I disregarded it. I said, thanks, mate, you know, 
and just kept getting our gear, put my harness on. And next minute, one of the ambulance officers that I used to work with when I was an ambulance officer came up and he said, gas, gas. I said, what, mate? He's moving. He's actually, his arms are moving. I said, what? You telling me he's alive? He said, yeah. And I couldn't believe it. I went into disbelief for about a millisecond and I turned around to my crew and said, Stat, let's hurry. We've got a live one, a rescue. What? And it was just a total shock and disbelief. It really was. So I hurried, put my harness on. We got a rope over the edge. I put a backpack on, which is like full of hospital, pre-hospital or first aid gear. And, uh, and then I clipped onto the rope and I abseiled down. Uh, abseiling means I slid down the rope, bouncing off the cliff on the way down, got to the bottom, uh, several hundred feet there, and uh, went across and knelt beside him. And I started to do my checks on him. And next minute, he opened his eyes and looked at me. But I looked down his body and I could see he had multiple fractures. I mean, from his belly button down, the umbilicus down, there's absolute multiple fractures. I noticed too, he was not breathing really well. He had a head injury and, uh, and he was in a real, real mess. And so I started doing my first aid. And I called for an oxyviva, which was lowered to me, and gave him some oxygen therapy and started immobilising and binding up his wounds and stopping bleeding. And he kept pulling things away, stopping me doing it. And I'm saying, mate, mate, keep still. And he was confused, but looking at me, he said, stop it, mate, just don't do that. Now, you might realise that I'm dressed in white overalls with a blue climbing helmet on that we use in rescue squad. And as I'm treating, I'm saying, mate, please stop that. I want to save your life. And he said, save my life? He said, I'm dead. I'm already dead. And I said, no, you're not. He said, yes, I am. I jumped off the cliff. I said, mate, you're not dead at all. You're alive. And he said, oh, no. Oh, no. And he started crying uncontrollably. And he started shaking. I'm saying, stay calm. And I've called for the stretcher, which has been lowered to me. It's on the way. As I continued to try and immobilise him and he kept trying to resist. And he's saying, let me die. Let me die. Let me die. And I said, I can't let you die. I said, I've got to do what I can. And he said, you're an angel. You can let me die. You're an angel. You can let me die. And I said, no, I'm not an angel. I'm Gary Raymond from Police Rescue, he saw me in this in his confusion and his white overalls and this sort of tight blue climbing helmet and actually thought I was an angel. That's the second time in my police career that someone thought I was an angel. Now, when did someone last think you're an angel? Oh, never? Okay, I've got two up on you. So as I was treating this gentleman, I'm telling him, I'm saying, look, stop it. Stop, because he kept trying to pull my bandages off and I had some pressure dressings on some bleeding wounds, kept trying to pull them off and I'd have to redress it. And I'm getting a bit agitated with him saying, mate, stop this. And he just stared at me and he said, let me die. I said, no. And then I got a bit agitated and I said, mate, listen to me. I said, I've recovered many bodies from around these cliffs and I've never seen anyone survive. This is a miracle. God is trying to show you something. And he sort of said, God, God, God. I said, yes, yes. And that was quite amazing because after I mentioned God and I said to him, and I said, look, I'm going to pray for you in Jesus' name. And I prayed for him. And as the stretcher arrived, we put him on a, a spinal carry board, lashed him on lift him into the Stokes litter stretcher, which is like a basket rescue stretcher. You see them, rescue squads use them, the ambulance and helicopters. And as I was lifting him up, I was on the stretcher, we were coming up, and he was just crying uncontrollably. He was in, we gave him some stuff for the pain, some um, what they call a green whistle, and up we went and into the ambulance and rushed him to hospital. 
Down the bottom, I said to him, I said, I've never seen anyone survive this. I said, God has a plan for your life. And I thought, well, that's if he survives. I thought any minute he's going to die, you know, because of the incredible injuries he had and the blood loss was starting to become quite an issue. But then the paramedics started to replace some of his blood volume on the way to hospital. So I went up, we packed our equipment up and uh, went back to the rescue base. And I'll never forget that. It was just the most amazing thing. And we found out what happened was, now this sounds sad in a way, but normally people look where they're going to jump and then they jump. He didn't. He ran up the footpath straight over the fence and over the cliff. And that part of the cliff face just south of the gap There's a number of ledges and he's come over, hit one ledge, bounced off onto another, to another, to another, to another, and then down the bottom. And so, in other words, his fall or his jump had been broken several times. I mean, he was broken, all right, and he survived. I've never seen it since, and it was just an incredible thing. So at the rescue squad, I just went about my duties for the next year or so. Now, in the meantime, this fellow recovers and he came to the rescue squad and I was upstairs doing instructions. I was teaching some new rescue recruits in the police force and and someone came to the door and says, oh, there's a bloke downstairs to see you. So I went went down and saw this fellow on a walking frame. I said, oh, g'day, sir. Um, You wanted to see me. And he said, um, yeah, I felt so embarrassed. Do you meet someone sometimes and they say, oh, g'day, how are you going? You think, who are they? Where, are they? where, do, they know, where do I know them from? Oh, you know, where, where, where? What's, I don't even know their name or where they're from. I said to this gentleman, I said, sir, huge apology, huge. I said, I don't remember you. Who are you? I said, obviously, you've had some injuries. And he said, you should remember me. I said, oh, should I? He said, yeah. He said, you're my angel. Oh, you're the bloke at the gap. He said, yeah. I said, mate, come in. How you doing? Tell me what happened. Tell me how you, how you been recovering. And, and so we we made a cup of tea and, a, and uh, we're talking. And after a little while, he turned to one of the doorways and he went, whoosh, he whistled. So that's strange, but out of the doorway, like a surprise birthday party, came this lovely lady and two little kids, a little boy and a little girl. And he said, Gary, this is my wife and this is my little son and my little daughter. And he said, this is the man that saved my life. This is my angel. And uh, so we continued. His wife said that she didn't want to see him in the hospital after his suicide attempt, hated him, was really resentful against what he did. And one of her girlfriends said, come on, you've got to come to church. So this fellow's wife started going to church and gave her life to Jesus. After that, she decided to go and visit her husband in the hospital. She went in the room and they started to, to talk And she said, I've given my life to Christ and I want to talk to you about our lives. And he said, so have I. She said, what? He said, yes. This is what happened, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. The hospital chaplain came in to visit him in hospital and he sat down and he was talking about it. He said, look, I've read your, your case history. He said, Boy, for you to survive a jump at the gap like that, God must have an amazing plan for your life. And he said, have you been talking to that police rescue bloke? I said, no, I know Gary, but I haven't been talking to him about you or your case. He said, that's what he said when he was kneeling beside me down the bottom of the gap on the rocks, that God had a plan and he'd never seen anyone survive this before. And the chaplain said, well, yeah, I said the same and I said, I haven't talked to Gary. 
He said, don't you think God's trying to get through to you? And there's that again. We read in John 14 where God would manifest himself to people. And again, the way he does it, (laughs) his ways are totally, totally and utterly, you know, higher than our ways, that's for sure. I, I just get amazed by the way he works. So they reconciled their marriage and again go to church together. As I was sitting there, he looked at his little son and he nodded. And the little boy came up to me and he grabbed my hand and he said, thank, thank you, Mr. Raymond, for saving Daddy's life. Wow. And the little girl came up and, and took my other hand. She said, thank you, thank you for bringing Daddy home. Wow. The tears are flowing down my face. All I could do then was just bow my head and start praying, which I did. I prayed with them and the rescue guys were all there as well. And I'll tell you what, there wasn't a dry eye in the police rescue squad that day. God can take the worst of circumstances. I often call it he can take miracles out of messes. Now, don't get me wrong. Not every mess becomes a miracle. I know that, I know that. But on occasions, we see God's ways totally and utterly go beyond our ways and our thoughts, beyond our thoughts. Isn't it amazing? Well, we've got a God who is a, a just loves us so deeply and he desires no one perishes, by the way. To finish today, a police officer approached me some time ago and he said, hey, chaplain, because one of my jobs is chaplain to the police post-trauma support group and I'm also a New South Wales ambulance chaplain as well. Well, he said, chaplain, what's this Jesus died on the cross stuff mean? He said, I don't know what that means. He said, well, the best example I can give you is this. Imagine you're driving down the road, you're doing 80 kilometres an hour and next minute, whoa, 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 whoa. The highway patrol put you over. Excuse me, sir. You're exceeding the speed limit. No, I'm not. I'm doing my 80. Yes, sir, but look. And the police officer points to a sign that says 50. Oh, no, I'd forgotten this was a 50 area. I was in a hurry. I need to get somewhere. I need to see someone. I'm sorry, officer. You've caught me, Nate. I'm exceeding the speed limit. Give me the ticket. So the officer writes the ticket out, although now they do it electronically. Imagine he writes the ticket out for you offending the traffic law. You've been caught fair and square, and here's your penalty notice, your ticket. And I said to this young cop, I said, can you imagine that just before you drive off, the police officer says, so before you go, give me that ticket back. And you hand the ticket to him, and the police officer says, sir, I'm going to pay that fine for you. I know you can't afford a fine and to lose a licence would be very bad for your lifestyle and your family and your work. So not only am I going to pay that fine for you, but when I get back to the station, I'm going to erase all of your driving and criminal history and put it onto me, onto my record. You can't do that. I was the one that offended. You caught me and booked me. You know, you can't do that. Well, I want to do it because I care for you. And I said to the officer, this young constable, I said, you know what, that's what Jesus did on the cross. Our sin has offended God. And don't trivialise that at all. God's offended by our sin. But guess what? He's booked us. Yep, caught us fair and square. We can't wiggle out of it. But guess what he did? His only son paid the fine and took our record on himself so that we're not in debt anymore to the fines and our record is clean in God's sight. This police officer looked at me and he gave a harsh smile and he started to cry. And he went, Chaplain, now I get it. And as he closed his eyes and crying, he said, Lord Jesus, thank you for paying my fines. And maybe there's someone here today 
but you've got a lot of debt, a lot of fines, and a lot of punishment coming. But guess what? Thank Jesus today that when he died on the cross, he paid it all. Paid in full as a free gift because of his love, his mercy, and his grace. Grace is we don't deserve to get off it. But God's grace says we do through Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for listening. And I want to give God the glory for everything he's done in my life and everything he's going to do. And so, again, bless you each and continue to think about and always thank Jesus for what he's done and going to do for us. Thank you.